Hello and welcome to today's lesson on sampling design. This is our first introduction into working with surveys and experiments. Okay, so when we think about this, whenever we're thinking about a survey, you know, you had your two questions that you had to go through and gather data on yesterday. You know, how do we gather data? We can use surveys, opinion polls, we see those all the time, you know, on Twitter, on TV, in the newspaper, interviews, studies, it can be an observational study, a retrospective study, so you're collecting data on things that have already happened. So you're just going back into the annals and collecting data. Or a prospective study where you're looking at things in the future. And then lastly, we can do an experiment to conduct and gather information. Okay, now we have a lot of terminology that we have to get through to start this unit, to start our work in statistics. Okay, the first thing is defining the population. And it's the entire group of individuals that we want information about. It doesn't have to be the entire population of the planet. Okay, it can be the population of a school, population of a state. Okay, it doesn't have to be people, it can be things but it's the entire group of individuals that we want to gather information about. When we do a census, the United States does a census every 10 years, and it's a very lengthy process. And it's a complete count of the entire population. So you're gathering information about every individual when you conduct a census. Why would we not want to use a census all the time? Okay, not very accurate. Okay, there is a lot of error in census, and we'll talk about bias and different types of errors that come into place as we go through this lesson. Um, but it takes a long time, and it's almost impossible to get every individual. You know, doing a census is very expensive. Okay, you have to use the entire population. Okay, trying to get all of that information, hiring people to do that work, you know, testing all the product. Okay, and in some cases it's impossible to do a census. Okay, we want the average weight of a white-tailed deer. We're not going to be able to gather every deer and weigh it. Um, if we're testing every vehicle for crash safety rating we would have to crash every car made by that one automaker okay and that's what we're looking at here in number four destructive sampling you would destroy the population breaking strengths of soda bottles lifetime of flashlight batteries safety ratings for cars in all of these situations you would destroy or lose the product in that testing process so we would not want to do a census in that case so then what we want to do and this is the basis of almost all statistics is we want to gather a sample of the data sample is part of the population we actually examine in order to gather information overall okay we use the sample to generalize about the population so this is making an educated guess based on the information that we can gather from a small part of the population. So now, when we're doing our sampling design, there are a number of ways to design your sample. We want to make sure that we're doing it accurately and properly. Okay, so we're using a method to choose the sample from the population, and there's different ways to do this. Some are better than others, but we're going to look at those different possibilities here today. Okay, your sampling frame is the list of all individuals in the population. Okay, so for Minnetonka High School, we would list out every individual from the high school and that would be the sampling frame. For this class, I could just pick the class list and that would be the sampling frame. Okay, but it is a list of every individual in the population. 
So when we want to do a simple random sample, this is the most common process that's used, okay, doing a simple random sample, okay, it's a situation where every set, whatever your size is of individuals from the population, is chosen in such a way that every individual has an equal chance of being selected. Okay, and that's the important part of a simple random sample is every individual has that equal chance of being selected as a part of the process. Okay, so if we're going to take a simple random sample of 100 students, put each student's name in a hat, and then we just randomly select 100 names from the hat. Okay, each student has that same chance of being selected. And what we want to remember here, the most important word, and you're always going to have to use this word to get full credit, is the word random. Okay, we're doing a random selection from the names in the hat. Okay, and then every set of individuals has an equal chance of being selected. So we're looking at that same situation. Every possible group of 100 students has the same chance of being selected. Okay. So we've got, so we have to understand some of the limitations, though, of a simple random sample. Okay. Since it is random, it's possible that we, all 100 students chosen from the high school are seniors. So now, some different types of sampling that we can do. If we want to make sure that there isn't a possibility for all 100 to be seniors, what we can do is what we call stratify. Okay, divide the population into groups first. And that's the important part. The division happens before we random sample. Okay, so we have males and females, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Okay, there's a lot of ways that we can stratify. You just have to define the characteristics that you're dividing the individuals by. And then we do a simple random sample pulled from each of the strata. So if we want to take a stratified random sample of 100 MHS students, okay, divided by grade level, okay, we can randomly select 50 seniors, 50 juniors. If we want an upperclassman, survey. Okay, if we want a whole school survey, we would randomly select 25 students from each grade to get our 100 student sample. Okay, this one isn't used as much, but we'll talk about it real quick, a systematic random sampling. Okay, this is something that we see happen once in a while. Okay, we're going to follow a systematic approach. But this is the most important part. It has to be randomized somewhere. So what we have to do is randomly select where to begin our sample. Okay, so if we want to do a systematic random sample of MHS students, okay, and we've got to update these numbers. We're up to about 3,200 overall. Okay, so if we want a sample of 100, okay, we need to select every 20th student from the group. Select that random number between 1 and 20. Okay, that gives us a starting point that's random instead of starting with a specific individual. And then that ensures that each individual has the same chance of being selected. Cluster sampling. Cluster sampling is something that we can do for convenience. And it's something that's used often, okay, based upon a location. Okay, we have some specific locations that we want to know about. Okay, so we take the locations, we randomly pick a location, and then sample everyone in that spot. So we could take all the math classrooms and randomly select a classroom and then sample every individual from that room overall. Okay, and then we've got a multi-stage sample. We're almost done here. You know, I know this is a lot of information early on. 
Okay, selecting successively smaller groups within the population in stages. So we randomly select at each level. So we could start with the entire United States and then randomly select a few states. And then within those states, we can randomly select a few counties. But you have to use a simple random sample at each of those stages. Okay, so we divide the period two classes by level, randomly select four second period classes from each group, then we randomly select five students from each of those classes. Okay, so this is an important piece of getting down to that smaller individual based on a multiple process of selecting the individuals. Okay, simple random sample. Okay, we want to understand that there's advantages, disadvantages to all of these processes. The advantages of a simple random sample. Okay, it's an unbiased estimator. Okay, so it's not affected by areas of bias, and we'll look at some of those overall. Okay, easy to do. The disadvantages, large variance. Okay, so from sample to sample, they can be very different. And it may not be representative of the overall group. Okay, and you have to have a list of the entire population to be able to do a simple random sample. A stratified sample. The advantages, more precise, unbiased estimator, because you're making sure that you're getting individuals from each group. Less variability. Okay, the cost reduced if the strata already exists. The disadvantages, difficult to do if you must divide the stratum. And then the formulas for calculating standard deviation and confidence intervals are more, are more complicated. So when we're looking at the calculations, the more levels that we add in, the more difficult the calculations will get. And you still need the entire sampling frame. Systematic random sample, advantages, unbiased, okay, ensures that the sample is distributed across the population. Okay, it's an efficient process because you just can go through your set count to get the individuals. You don't necessarily need the sampling frame. The disadvantages, you can have a large variance, okay, and it can be confounded by a trend or cycle. Okay, so if there's a trend of how people come into the building and you're sampling every 20th, you might miss some groups based on those pieces. And then once again, we're adding in multiple pieces. The formulas become more are complicated for our work. Cluster sample, advantages, unbiased, cost is reduced, sampling frame may not be available. It's okay, we're selecting by area. Disadvantages, the clusters may not be representative of a population. You know, if we sampled this class as a cluster, this might not be representative of the entire school, you know, because we're all seniors and juniors, okay, and it might not be representative of students of all level based on this being an AP class. Okay, so we're looking at the sampling design here. We want to be able to identify what type it is. First divides all colleges into groups of similar types, and then randomly select three colleges from each group. Okay, that's stratified. Okay, remember, they divided schools up first. They found the strata first and then sampled, and that's what makes it a stratified random sample. Okay, looking at this one. randomly selects blocks in her district and then surveys all who live on those blocks. So she randomly selected an area and sampled everyone. That is a cluster sample. Every tenth customer, as soon as you see that, you should think systematic. And then what we can do, and we don't do this as often anymore, is using a random digit table to do our selection process, okay, but it's something that we want to, you know, just look at and know and understand. 
each entry is equally likely to be any of the 10 digits. Digits are independent of each other. So we can have rows and what we do is we go through a systematic sampling process to select the individuals for a given survey. Okay, we can read in any direction, up and down, side to side, diagonally. Okay, and these digits from, you know, zero to nine are equally distributed throughout this process. Okay, so if we wanted to select from this group, we've numbered everyone, okay, because they have to all have an individual label, and we're going to use the random digits to do this selection process. Okay, so we're going to start with row one, reading across. Since some people have two-digit numbers, we have to give everybody a two-digit number. So Aiden would actually be 01, Bob would be 02. Okay, we've got 45, not in the list. 18, we've selected that person. 5, 13, 71, we leave out. 1, ignore, ignore. Okay, 15. Okay, and then we stop when we have our five individuals. Okay, now, our last piece for today is introducing areas of bias. Okay, so how can bias be introduced into a survey design, no matter what type of design it is? We have specific types of error that come in that affect or favor certain outcomes in the situation. Okay, so you can see there are a lot of different ways where we can introduce bias. Okay, so now sources of bias, things that can cause bias in your sample. Okay, we can't do anything with bad data. Voluntary response, this is probably the number one area of bias in any survey or any opinion poll. And based on the term, you can pretty much guess what it is. People can choose whether to respond or not. When this happens, we're going to get extreme viewpoints. If a person's just in the middle, they're not as likely to call in. But if you're really against something, really in favor of something, then you're going to volunteer to respond. Okay, so we can see these examples, you know, all of your call-in shows, you know, American Idol, America's Got Talent, you know, all of those select themselves to participate. Okay, make sure, did they select themselves? Okay, any product review is a voluntary response. People are volunteering to respond to a product review, so you're going to get your extreme viewpoints. Convenience sampling, asking people that are easy to ask. These two almost go a little bit hand in hand, okay, because a lot of voluntary response is also a convenience sample. Okay, you know, asking the people in your classroom. Most of your survey information that you gathered for that day one experiment was a convenience sample. You were just asking people that were easy to get to. Okay, it can produce bias response because it can fall right into a voluntary response. But here you're getting information from, you know, easy sources and that can change the results you get. Okay, under coverage. Okay, when we look at under coverage as a bias piece, who is not being represented in the sampling process? You know, if it's a phone-in poll, you know, people that don't have telephones, if it is a newspaper or TV poll, people that don't read the newspaper, don't um, watch the TV show, are being undercovered in that sample.
you know, so here's some examples for the phone in polls. You know, unlisted numbers, people without phones. Okay, so you're losing some of those groups. Okay, non response. This is always a choice that an individual has. They can choose to not respond to a sample. Okay, and we're losing their information. Okay, they were chosen, but they refused to participate. Okay, this is not self selection. Okay, so if you walked up to somebody and asked them the question and they chose not to respond, that's non-response. Okay, it's not opting out of a voluntary situation. Okay, so you have to understand they're chosen but they refuse to participate for non-response. You know, so when you look at the telephone surveys, you know, most people don't even answer their phone anymore if they don't notice the number. You know, that is a non-response situation. Okay, and then we're making the follow-up. You like the crickets in the background. I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, somebody let some uh, crickets loose in the school. So that's a, a fun first couple of days we've got here. Okay, and then response bias. People responding in a nature that they think they want to hear. Okay, so occurs when the behavior of the respondent or interviewer causes bias in the sample. A response bias could be, you know, if you're asked by a police officer about an illegal activity, you know, the response is going to be biased because you're talking to a police officer and you wouldn't want to incriminate yourself. Okay, so we just talked about this, you know, a uniformed police officer asking a class about drug abuse. Okay, we would not get honest answers in that situation. Okay, the wording of questions can be a response bias piece. Okay, you know, based on all the shootings in Chicago, should we have more gun control laws? You know, you're leading people to a specific type of question. Okay, so you have to make sure your questions are worded as neutral as possible. This is something that you want to look at at your survey questions. Okay, you know, the use of big technical words can introduce bias because people just not understanding the term, you know, would affect how they respond to the individual piece. Okay, so you have to think about your group that you're working with. You know, I always drive by the sign and, you know, it seems a little funny to me, Nimrod, Minnesota. Okay, you know, you want to be careful of your vocabulary there, surveying doctors. You can use more complex technical terms. Okay, so let's look through at a, a few situations here. Identify the source of bias and then we're wrapped up for the day here. Okay, so before the presidential election, survey of 10 million people predicted that Roosevelt would win. The Diages survey came from the magazine subscribers. Okay, so what type of bias do we have there? Okay, under coverage. Okay, if they're only surveying their readers, okay, we wouldn't have people from other groups. Okay, what type of bias do we have here? Okay. Register receipts from students as they leave the bookstore during lunch one day. Okay, it's a convenient sample. Okay, you sampled the easiest way. Okay, and under coverage, you know. The fact that they're leaving lunch, did they not eat lunch that day? Those would be undercovered. Did they buy their books in another way? They would be undercovered.
Okay, average value of a home in Minnetonka, one average is the price of homes that are listed for sale with a realtor. Okay, this is under coverage. Okay, houses that are not for sale, okay, wouldn't be included in that calculation. Okay, and that ends our lesson for today. Okay, thank you and have a good day.